Hi, welcome back to History and Philosophy of Science and Medicine. I'm Matt Brown. Today we're talking about values and disease screening um, and the, the science uh, and decision making behind disease, disease screening in medicine. I want to remind you about something we talked about last week having to do with uh, inductive risk. So if you remember, um, uh, according to the way we talked about this last week, um, you have if you have a hypothesis like chemical X is safe for human consumption, um, and that's a hypothesis that could be true or false. It's also based on the evidence that you get from the, the data you collect. You could choose to accept or reject the hypothesis, and therefore possible situations. Either you uh, accept the hypothesis and the hypothesis is true, which is great, that's what you want, or you reject the hypothesis and the hypothesis is false, also uh, great. Either way, you've got the right answer. But if you uh, accept the hypothesis, but the hypothesis is actually false, you have a false positive result, right? It's a form of error. Similarly, if you reject the hypothesis, but the hypothesis is actually true, that's a false negative error, right? Presumably, the chemical is safe or it's not to some criteria of safety, and uh, you accept or reject it or not, and so you use these four possibilities, and two of them are forms of error. Now, if you have a false positive error, um, the consequences of that could be risk to human life and health, because if you accept the hypothesis that the, um, that the chemical is safe, and so you don't regulate it or ban it, but it in fact is not safe, then you're gonna have those risks, those, those consequences. On the other hand, if you reject the hypothesis, if you, if you say it's not safe, and then you go ahead and regulate it or ban it, then you're going to forego the benefits of chemical X and there are gonna be economic losses to the producers of it and, and so on and so forth, right? So these are the kinds of um, considerations that uh, one has to weigh in order to make judgments about the evidence, right? So in designing studies, in determining what the criteria uh, for accepting or rejecting the hypothesis is going to be, you have to, you have to weigh these possible consequences and the risks associated with them and, and set your standards accordingly. That's what we talked about last time. Now suppose we switch the case a little bit. Um, our hypothesis now is not concerning some chemical safety question. It's concerning a, a, the situation of a particular patient, right? The, the hypothesis in question is that, patient, uh, the, the, that a patient uh, has condition X that's going to cause disease. For example, they may have um, some kind of uh, growth of cells in their breast that is going to cause uh, breast cancer um, disease. We might have a test of this hypothesis through a screening technology like screening mammography, right? And the screening test has the same structure of possible choices. Either the, um, either the condition is going to cause disease or not, right? Um, at, at some, at some, for some criteria of disease, and we can choose. Uh, we can design our. Um, we can design our screening test in various ways, uh, but there's always going to be some probability of uh, false positive or false negative error. So false positive, your test come back comes back and says you have the disease or you have the condition that will lead to disease, um, but you actually don't or a uh, false negative error, it says you're fine, the test says you're fine, but in fact, you have uh, the disease or the conditions that are precursors to the disease, okay? Now, the assumption is gonna be that um, this test is, is going to, in, in many cases, where there's a treatment available, is gonna lead to certain kinds of treatment. So um, whenever we accept the hypothesis that the patient has the disease or has the condition that will cause disease, um, we are presuming also that we're going to treat, uh, treat that accordingly. There's gonna be some kind of treatment decision made on the basis of that information. Okay, and here again, we have the same kind of uh, inductive risk issues, right? If you have a false positive error, 
then there are risks of overtreatment, um, of stigma, if the disease carries some form of social stigma, of the mental distress of being told you have a disease when you, in fact you don't have the disease. Um, all of these things are, are consequences of a false positive error and the things we risk um, based on the, the, the probability of a false positive error. Similarly, for a false negative error, if we tell you you're fine but you're not, then we're risking increased morbidity and mortality, right? So these are the kinds of errors that need to be balanced in the design of, of screening, uh, medical screening techniques and technologies, right? So um, you might, in the case of, uh, of um, cancer screening, for example, you might start with uh, a, an, an early detection test that um, tries to minimize false negative errors, but has lots of false positives. Um, as long as you can follow that up in relatively short time with a second test that is, uh, that is less, um, that may be more expensive or more difficult, but has a much lower false positive rate, right? Um, th those are the kinds of choices. There are both economic uh, aspects to these choices, as well as these sort of social ethical consequences to, um, to human well-being. Uh, at stake. We should think also in the, con in the context of our discussion today, not only about the, the inductive risks involved in a particular screening test, um, which, is, which is definitely relevant to patient treatment and um, medical decision making, we should also think about the inductive risk involved in uh, the evidence about those screening tests. So both of the articles that you read for today by Plutinska and um, by Karani and Fernandez Pinto um, look at breast cancer screening and the evidence that engaging in those screenings is effective, right? So our hypothesis in this case might be that screening for condition X, say breast cancer, is effective for patients in group Y, say women age 40 to 50, right? Um, if we say, if, if, our, if our sort of, if the hypothesis, if we accept the hypothesis, right, and uh, therefore we have a policy recommendation or a medical recommendation that women 40 to 50 in, in that group should receive the screening, right, we risk all the same sort of consequences of a false positive error, overtreatment, stigma, mental distress, et cetera. Um, if we do not give the, if we do not recommend the screening, um, then there's a risk of false negative error that, that has the consequences of increased morbidity and mortality. And, and you know, we can compare the individual level here uh, that we were talking about before with the, with the mass level. So the, 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 the judgment about effectiveness in the population, right, is a judgment about um, sort of the, uh, what's going to happen to the whole group of people uh, that does or does not get this treatment. You know, for individuals, right, there's always going to be some uh, cases of breast cancer that are caught early and receive treatment. Um, and, you know, if they get this, if they get this screening, their lives are going to be extended. Um, there are going to be other cases where people slip by as a false negative. They're not going to get detected and they're not going to get treatment uh, early on. Similarly, there are going to be false positives. There are going to be those who suffer from overtreatment um, or, or the mental distress that goes with overdiagnosis. But the question is sort of, you know, stacking it all up in the, in the mass, right, for the whole population is the risks, are the risks associated worth it, right? Is it worthwhile for, um, uh, for a person in this group to get the, um, the screening uh, or are their odds of harm greater than their odds of being helped? Right? Now there are a number of sources of uncertainty about the effectiveness of disease screening that are discussed in the readings. Uh, choice of endpoint, right? Uh, this this uh, is a question of what it is we're measuring for effectiveness. Are we, effect, are we measuring survival time from detection, say? If we introduce an early detection technology, um, does that increase survival time? Um, 
But that can be a biased endpoint, right? Because uh, others who are not detected at all um, uh, until later, you know, there there may be, it may be that you don't you don't actually extend life; you just extend the time uh, uh, that you know that they are going to have the disease. Um, also, the choice of disease-specific or all-cause mortality is a, a crucial uh, um, uh, case of uncertainty. There are some screening technologies where you can show that it makes it less likely that they're going to die from the disease that the, that's detected, right? Um, but that they're also not li they're not likely to live any longer. So there's no no reduction in all-cause mortality. Um, that's a little bit puzzling, right? They, they don't die from the thing you detected and treated them for, but they still die just at the same age. Uh, on average, you know, these are, again, these are population level uh, uh, results, not individual level results. That's puzzling, but, but partly it's because um, uh, it's, it's harder to detect reductions to all-cause mortality because there are so many more factors involved. There are biases and confounds of various kinds in trial design and in the results of those trials. Um, these, are, these are covered in great detail in the readings. Um, there, there are various ways in which um, either the researchers, the statistical techniques, or even the patients can be biased by the trial design. There's a variety of choices in your meta-analysis and your systematic reviews that means that um, uh, even when you're aggregating a large number of trials on the same question, you can come to diverging uh, judgments for or against the effectiveness of a screening for a particular group. There are also a lot of unknowns about the disease etiology and mortality. Um, uh, so, so uh, you know, what, it, what causes the disease? How does the disease progress? and how many people in the general population all, all, uh, actually die from the disease are things that we may not know a lot about. In many cases, we, we don't know a lot about um, uh, what the causes of breast cancer are, what the progression of breast cancer is at a biological level. Um, and uh, you know, for many diseases, our estimates of, of, um, of who dies from those, uh, from those diseases is, is a little bit uncertain, right, based on um, how we decide to measure it uh, uh, and estimate it. There's also competing and uncertain evidence concerning overdiagnosis rates. So what constitutes an overdiagnosis? We have a clear definition. You know, someone is overdiagnosed if that they are diagnosed as having a disease, but uh, the disease is not actually going to um, uh, uh, lead to, lead to real symptoms, detectable symptoms, um, or experienceable symptoms uh, in the life course of the patient, right? So for example, some cancers, right, can be detected quite early, but they grow so slowly that the patient dies of natural causes long before the disease, the, the, the cancerous growth would cause any disease. There's also conflict over how we measure the harms of overdiagnosis, right? So not only what is the rate which uh, people are overdiagnosed, but how bad is it? Um, and we don't agree how to, about how to measure that. One of the things to keep in mind is that research funding itself is biased towards detection and treatment, not prevention. Right? There's a, there's a kind of crass economic reason for this. Um, there is no profit in prevention, but there is profit in uh, providing treatment. Right. So it's it's natural that um, the the medical companies that provide the detection te technology would be interested in this and would provide funding for it. Um, also, you know, in some cases, uh, we don't, you know, the, the, the prevention is hard to figure out because we don't know what the causes are. Um, or there may not be preventable causes in some cases. Um, it's important, I think, also to point out that early detection is not the same as prevention, right? So some, some defend the importance of screening uh, technologies uh, as, a, as a general argument in favor of preventative medicine, uh, which is, you know, no doubt important. Um, but, but detecting something early uh, and treating it early is not the same thing as preventing uh, the disease from happening. All right, it's just early intervention, it's not prevention. 
Uh, those aren't the same. They should be they should be you know categorized separately. So. Um, you might ask, based on these readings, should we not do screening mammography or should we not do it until uh, you reach a certain age uh, range? And um, here, I, I think the authors and, and me personally don't have a specific medical recommendation to make, only to point out that the, the way that this is being decided is, is really fraught with these values. And so there may be a need for uh, a certain kind of um, patient autonomy here or also stakeholder um, consultation and, and consideration of a variety of perspectives before we make recommendations, right? What's clear is that um, the recommendations that are being made now that are in conflict with one another are being made on the basis of somewhat different um, values and motivations and biases. So that's uh, what we're talking about today. Um, I look forward to hearing what you think about, about this and, and the other issues raised by the reading. Um, so please uh, uh, weigh in on Discord, uh, leave a comment on the video or on the discussion board. Um, and I look forward to seeing uh, many of you in class. Otherwise, I look forward to talking to you next week.